Scenario 9. Culture. Real Scene 4. The Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. Man fears time, yet time fears the pyramids. Arab proverb. My goal. I will use the verbs have to and have got to. I learn to make suggestions and about the seven wonders of the ancient world. Introductory questions. 1. What do you know about the Pyramid of Giza? 2. Where is the Temple of Artemis located? 3. What is the Lighthouse of Alexandria? Introduction Although most people know that there is a list of the seven world wonders, only few can name them. The list of the seven wonders of the ancient world was originally compiled around the 2nd century BC. The first reference to the idea is found in the history of Herodotus as long ago as the 5th century BC. Decades later, Greek historians wrote about the greatest monuments at the time. Callimachus of Cyrene, 305 BC to 240 BC, chief librarian of the Alexandria Museum, wrote a collection of wonders around the world. All we know about the collection is its title, for it was destroyed with the Alexandria Library. The final list of the Seven Wonders was compiled during the Middle Ages. The list comprised the seven most impressive monuments of the ancient world, some of which barely survived to the Middle Ages. Others did not even coexist. Among the oldest references to the canonical list are the engravings by the Dutch artist Martin van Hemskerk, 1498, to 1574, and Johann Fischer von Erlach's history of architecture. Today, archaeological evidence reveals some of the mysteries that surrounded the history of the wonders for centuries. For their builders, the Seven Wonders were a celebration of religion, mythology, art, power and science. For us, they reflect the ability of humans to change the surrounding landscape by building massive yet beautiful structures one of which stood the test of time to this very day, the Great Pyramid of Giza. It is the oldest and last remaining of the seven wonders of the world. It is generally believed that the Great Pyramid was built as the tomb of the fourth Egyptian dynasty king Khufu, also known under his Greek name Cheops, and believed to have reigned from 2606 to 2583 BC after whom it is sometimes called Khufu's Pyramid or the Pyramid of Khufu. Traditionally, the architect of the pyramid was Helmno, a relative of Khufu. Believed by mainstream Egyptologists to have been constructed in approximately 20 years, the most widely accepted estimate for its date of completion is 2580 BC. The Great Pyramid is the oldest and largest of the three pyramids in the Giza necropolis, adjacent to the outskirts of modern Cairo, Egypt in Africa. Alternative theories suggest the Great Pyramid and the Giza complex date to a much earlier time period, long before Pharaonic Egyptian civilization. A few hundred meters southwest of Khufu's Great Pyramid lies the slightly smaller pyramid of Khafre, one of Khufu's successors who is believed to have built the Great Sphinx, and a few hundred meters further southwest is the pyramid of Mankauri, Khafre's successor which is about half as tall. Khafre's pyramid appears the tallest on some photographs, as it is somewhat steeper and built on higher terrain. Grammar Structure 1 Have to, have got to, obligation and necessity You use have to to talk about obligation and necessity in the present and future. You use have got to in informal English. We have to pay the bill by Thursday. She has to go so soon. Writing exercise. Match the clauses in column A with the got to and have got to clauses in column B. Column A. 1. 
It's getting late. 2. You broke the window. 3. The car has broken down. 4. Mother is away. 5. I've got it all wrong. Column B. A. So I'm afraid we've got to walk. B. So I've got to start all over again. C. So we've got to look after ourselves. D. So you've got to pay for it. E. So we've got to go. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon The approach to the garden sloped like a hillside, and the several parts of the structure rose from one another, tier on tier. On all sides, the earth had been piled, and was thickly planted with trees of every kind, by their great size and other charm, gave pleasure to the beholder. The water machines rised, the water in great abundance from the river, although no one outside could see it. Didorius Hanging Gardens In their glory, people used to call them as the Hanging Gardens of Semiramis. Now in Iraq, they call them as the Walls of Babylon. They said that they were built by Nebuchadnezzar II around the year 600 BC. The Hanging Gardens are extensively documented by Greek historians such as Strabo and Diodorus Siculus, but otherwise there is no evidence for their existence. Some circumstantial evidence gathered that the excavation of the palace at Babylon has been accrued, but does not completely substantiate what look like fanciful descriptions. Some schools of thought think that through the ages the location may have been confused with gardens that existed at Nineveh as tablets from over there clearly depicting gardens have been found. Writings on these tablets describe the possible use of something similar to an Archimedes screw as a means of raising the water to the required height. According to accounts, the gardens were built to cheer up Nebuchadnezzar's homesick wife, Amitis. Amitis, daughter of the king of Medes, was married to Nebuchadnezzar to create an alliance between the nations. The land she came from, though, was green, rugged and mountainous, and she found the flat, sun-baked terrain of Mesopotamia, a region of South Asia, depressing. The king decided to recreate her homeland by building an artificial mountain with rooftop gardens. The hanging gardens probably did not really hang in the sense of being suspended from cables or ropes. The name comes from an exact translation of the Greek word kremastos, or the Latin word pensilis, which means not just hanging, but overhanging, as in the case of a terrace or balcony. The Statue of Zeus in his right hand, a figure of victory made from ivory and gold. In his left hand, his scepter inlaid with all metals, and an eagle perched on the scepter. The sandals of the god were made of gold, as is his robe. Pasesius, the Greek, 2nd century BC, the statue of Zeus at Olympia carved by the famed classical sculptor Phidias, 5th century BC, circa 435 BC. In present day, Greece is traditionally one of the seven wonders of the world. In 394 AC, after over 800 years at Olympia, it was taken to Constantinople, modern Istanbul, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. Historians believe it was probably destroyed in an accidental fire. The seated statue occupied the whole width of the aisle of the temple that was built to house it. According to the contemporary source, it was about 12 meters, about 40 feet tall. It seems that if Zeus were to stand up, the geographer Strabo noted early in the first century BC, he would unroof the temple. Zeus was carved from ivory. Technically, the ivory was soaked in a liquor that made it more malleable. So the ivory was probably both shaped and carved as necessary. 
and was seated in a magnificent throne of cedarwood, inlaid in ivory, gold, ebony, and precious stones. In Zeus's right hand there was a small statue of Nike, the goddess of victory, and in his left hand a shining scepter on which an eagle perched. His sandals are made of gold, as is his robe. Visitors, like the Roman general Aemilius Polis, the victor over Macedon, were moved to awe by the godlike majesty and splendor that Phidias had captured. Perhaps the greatest discovery in terms of finding out about this wonder came in 1958 with the excavation of the workship used to create the statue. This led archaeologists to be able to recreate the autonomy of the great work. The Temple of Artemis I have seen the walls and hanging gardens of ancient Babylon, the statue of Olympian Zeus, the Colossus of Rhodes, the mighty work of the High Pyramids, and the tomb of Mausolus. But when I saw the temple at Ephesus raising to the clouds, all these other wonders were put in the shade. Antipater of Sidon The sacred site at Ephesus was far older than the Artemisium. Pausanias understood the shrine of Artemis. Pausanias understood the shrine of Artemis there to be very ancient. He states with certainty that it antedated the iconic immigration by many years, being older even than the oracular shrine of Apollo and Didyme. He said that the pre-iconic inhabitants of the city were Lelegers or Lydians. The temple was designed by the Greek architect Chesiphron, built around 550 BC at the expense of Croesus, the wealthy king of Lydia. Marshy ground was selected for the building site as a precaution against future earthquakes, according to Pliny the Elder. The temple became a tourist attraction, visited by merchants, kings and sightseers, many of whom paid homage to Artemis in the form of jewellery and various goods. Its splendour also attracted many worshippers, many of whom formed the cult of Artemis. The temple was a widely respected place of refuge, a tradition that was linked in myth with the Amazons who took refuge there, both from Heracles and from Dionysus. The Temple of Artemis at Ephesus was destroyed on July 21, 356 BC, in an act of arson committed by Herostratus. According to the story, his motivation was fame at any cost, thus the term Herostratic fame. A man was found to plan the burning of the Temple of Ephesian Diana, so that through the destruction of this most beautiful building, his name might be spread through the whole world. Valerius Maximus The Ephesians, outraged, announced that Herostratus' name never be recorded. Strabo later noted the name, which is how we know it today. That very same night, Alexander the Great was born. Plutarch remarked that Artemis was too preoccupied with Alexander's delivery to save the burning temple. Alexander later offered to pay for the temple's rebuilding, but the Ephesians refused. Eventually, the temple was restored after Alexander's death in 323 BC. This reconstruction was itself destroyed during a raid by the Goths in 262 BC, in the time of Emperor Galenus. Respa, Veduc and Thurua, leaders of the Goths, took a ship and sailed across the Strait of Hellespont to Asia. There they laid waste many populous cities and set fire to the renowned temple of Diana at Ephesus, reported Giordanes in Getia. During the next two centuries, the majority of Ephesians converted to Christianity and the temple of Artemis lost its religious appeal. Christians tore down the remnants of the temple and the stones were used in the construction of other buildings. The main primary sources for the temple of Artemis at Ephesus are in Pliny the Elder's Natural History xxxb1.xx1.95, Poponius Mela the first, 17, and Plutarch's Life of Alexander, 111.5, referencing the burning of the Artemisium. The site of the temple was rediscovered in 1869 by an expedition sponsored by the British Museum, 
And while several artifacts and sculptures from the reconstructed temple can be seen there today, as for the original site, only a single column remains from the temple itself. Grammar Structure 2 Should, Ought to, Obligation and Advice You use should and ought to to talk about milled obligation. You can also use had better to talk about milled obligation. We should send her a postcard. We shouldn't spend all the money. He ought to come more often. Writing. Exercise. Complete the following sentences using ought to or ought not to. 1. Drive carefully on a busy road. 2. Eat between meals if you want to lose weight. 3. Pay your bills regularly. 4. Be selfish. 5. Smoke too heavily. 6. Go to the dentist regularly. The mausoleum at Halicarnassus. I have seen over me in Halicarnassus a gigantic monument such as no other dead person has. Adorned in the finest way with statues of horses and men carved most realistically from the best quality marble. King Mausolus, in Lucian's Dialogues of the Dead. The mausoleum of Mausolus, the Persian satrap of Caria, 351 BC, at Halicarnassus, present Bodrum, Turkey, was one of the seven wonders of the world. The word mausoleum came to be used generically for any grand tomb. Mausoleum meaning in honour of Mausol. This enormous white marble tomb was built to hold the remains of Mausolus, a provincial king in the Persian Empire, and his wife, Artemisia. Greek architects Satyrus and Phythius designed the approximately 45 metre high tomb, 135 feet, and four famous Grecian sculptures added an ornamental frieze, decorated band, around its exterior. Grant's tomb in New York is based on a more scholarly reconstruction of the mausoleum. When the Persians expanded their ancient kingdom to include Mesopotamia, northern India, Syria, Egypt and Asia Minor, the king could not control his vast empire without the help of local governors or rulers, the satraps. Like many other provinces, the kingdom of Caria in the western part of Asia Minor was so far from the Persian capital that it was practically autonomous. From 377 to 353 BC, King Mausolus of Caria reigned and moved his capital to Halicarnassus. Nothing is exciting about Mausolus' life except the construction of his tomb. The project was conceived by his wife and sister, Artemisia, and the construction might have started during the king's lifetime. The mausoleum was completed around 350 BC, three years after Mausolus' death, and one year after Artemisia's. The Colossus of Rhodes To you, O son, the people of Dorian Rhodes set up this bronze statue reaching to Olympus when they had pacified the waves of war and crowned their city with the spoils taken from the enemy. Not only over the seas, but also on land did they kindle the lovely torch of freedom. Dedicatory Inscription on the Colossus The Colossus of Rhodes was a giant statue of the god Helios, erected on the Greek island of Rhodes by Charas of Lindus in the 3rd century BC. It was roughly the same size as the Statue of Liberty in New York, although it stood on a lower platform. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. 
Ancient accounts, which differ to some degree, describe the structure as being built around several stone columns, or towers of blocks, on the interior of the structure, standing on a 50-foot, 15-meter, white marble pedestal near the harbour entrance, others claim on a breakwater in the harbour. Iron beams were driven into the stone towers, and bronze plates attached to the bars formed the skinning. Much of the material was melted down from the various weapons Demetrius' army left behind, and the abandoned second siege tower was used for scaffolding around the lower levels. Upper portions were built with the use of a large earthen ramp. The statue itself was over 34 metres, 100 feet, tall. Construction completed in 282 BC after 12 years. The statue stood for only 56 years until Rhodes was hit by an earthquake in 226 BC. The statue snapped at the knees and fell over onto the land. But Ptolemy III offered to pay for the reconstruction of the statue, but an oracle made the Rhodians afraid that they had offended Helios and they declined to rebuild it. The remains lay on the ground for over 800 years, and even broken they were so impressive that many travelled to see them. Pliny the Elder remarked that few people could wrap their arms around a fallen thumb and that each of the fingers was larger than most statues. In 654 AC, an Arab force under Mawiya I captured Rhodes and, according to the chronicler Theophanes, the remains were sold to a travelling salesman from Edessa. The purchaser had the statue broken down and transported the bronze scrap on the backs of 900 camels to his home. Pieces continued to turn up for sale for years after being found on the caravan route. The Lighthouse of Alexandria Sostratus, the son of Dexiphanes, the Cnidian, dedicated this to the saviour gods on behalf of those who sail the seas. Dedicatory Inscription on the Lighthouse Sometimes called the Pharos of Alexandria, in reference to Pharos the island on which it resided, also Pharos or Pharos in Greek means lighthouse. The Lighthouse of Alexandria was built in the 3rd century BC and is traditionally considered one of the seven wonders of the world. It ceased operating and was largely destroyed as a result of two earthquakes in the 14th century. Its remains were found by divers in 1994 and subsequently more of it was revealed by satellite imaging. Its tower is estimated to have been 134 metres 440 feet high, easily one of the tallest man-made structures on earth at the time. Built out of blocks of white stone, the tower was made up of three stages, a lower square with a central core, a middle octagonal section, and, at the top, a circular section. At the apex was positioned a mirror which reflected sunlight during the day. A fire was lit at night. As it can be seen from images of the lighthouse on Roman coins struck by the Alexandrian mint, there were four statues of tritons blowing horns, one on every corner of the building. Also in the Roman period, there was a statue atop the tower. The design of minarets in many early Islamic mosques many centuries later followed a similar three-stage design to that of the Pharos, attesting to the building's broader architectural influence. Legends tell of the light from the lighthouse being used to burn enemy ships before they could reach shore. However, this is highly unlikely due to the relatively poor quality of optics and reflective technology in the time period in which the lighthouse existed. But only slightly less impressive, and probably more accurate, is the claim that the light from the lighthouse could be seen up to 35 miles, 56 kilometers, from shore. Research Spot Look for more information about Number 1. Seven New Wonders of the World 